Welcome. It's uh, great to have you here. Let me extend my very warm welcome uh, to that of Natasha's. My name's Warwick. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're in uh, Platinum, it's great to have you along. If you're watching on the live feed, it's also great to have you with us here on a hot summer day. If you were in that 20 to 35 age group that Natasha mentioned, August 5, let me give you a clue. Swipe right. Not saying anything more. That sure, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I'm going to cough. <coughs> uh, yeah. It'll be uh, the evening, 5 till 9.30. Put it aside. Swipe right. Okay, we're in a series. We're looking at Solomon from sun to sinner. And today we get to think about a building. Buildings are so much more than just structures to keep the sun off and the air conditioning in. Right? Walk into any news agency and head for the magazine rack, and what you'll find is scores of titles dedicated to helping us make our homes comfortable, desirable, symbols, statements, objects of envy. We've known about this for millennia. Just head to Egypt and check out the pyramids. They are a statement that is still being made thousands of years after they were built. Head to India and you'll discover a statement about love. Or head to my hometown and see that Australians are desperately trying to convince the world that we're cultured. <laughs> Whereas if you go to the White House, it just oozes power. That's the statement. Let me ask you this. What are public buildings? What do they do? Can you remember the first time that you walked out of Dubai Mall and looked up? Huh? April 2010. That's the first photo I ever took of the Burj. It's not very good. Uh, I had trouble getting it in, my camera. Did you have that problem as well? You sort of get down on the ground and try and get an... A yeah. I was expecting to be underwhelmed. I was expecting, you know, just another tall building. It is breathtakingly beautiful. I still love looking at it. I love taking friends who are visiting Dubai and showing it off. It's a truly great building. It's a symbol it's a statement, it's a declaration to the world about Dubai, about the people of the UAE, about what they can do and about who they are. That's what truly great public buildings do. And this morning we're going to look at the most famous public building in the Bible, the temple that Solomon built. It's a symbol, it's a statement. It too is a declaration to the world, not of Solomon's greatness, but of God's, of his holiness, of his love, of his immense power and glory. If you're someone who hasn't yet worked God out, I'm really glad that you are here with us this morning. Because as you come with me, as we look at this part of the Bible, I'm hoping that you'll get a really clear picture about just who the God of the Bible is, as well as an understanding of how you can engage with him. Here's an outline of where we're going this morning. If we're going to understand the statement that the temple is making, if we're going to understand what God is saying about himself in that building, we've got to understand something about the timing. Why did God get it made then during Solomon's reign? We've got to have a bit of a look at the building itself. We've got to get our heads around what the temple was like. We've also got to have a look at the promise that came with it, the promise that was given to Solomon while he was building it. And finally, we'll have a look at what that statement means to us, particularly as it's fulfilled in Jesus. Before we do that, how about we pray? How about we pray not just for ourselves as we look at God's Word, but how we pray for France? If you woke up this morning, you had heard some terrible news about scores uh, who were mown down in Nice. Let me pray for them as well. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we want to ask you to comfort the nation of France this morning. 
in your grace and mercy in their grief. Remind them of your kindness, your love, and your mercy. Father, when we hear about another act of terrorism, it doesn't matter whether it's here or in Baghdad or wherever, our hearts are broken and we long for there to be peace. You are the God of peace. And so we plead with you to bring the peace of your kingdom into our world. And Father, as we look at your word this morning, we pray that you would speak to us, make us men and women of peace who understand your plans and purposes and are shaped by them. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a little bit of a think about the timing. Why did God get Solomon to build the temple? Well, Solomon understands the reasons all too well. Grab your phones, grab your Bibles, grab the the text, and let's have a look at 1 Kings chapter 5, and let's see what Solomon said to the king of Tyre, a guy called Hiram, in chapter 5 and verse 2. Solomon sent word to Hiram. He said, you know that my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God. Why? Because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him, until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. David was busy pushing back the boundaries of Israel and establishing the land. But, says Solomon, but now the Lord my God has given me rest. Rest on every side, so that he can say there is neither adversary nor misfortune. Don't let those words rush past you. There are comments like this all the way through chapters 4 to 7. We keep being reminded again and again that this is an absolutely groundbreaking moment in the whole of human history. This is the first time that Israel had ever known peace. This is the first time that Israel had ever experienced God keeping all of his promises to them. In Genesis chapter 12 and 15 and 17, God had promised Abraham three things. He'd promised him the land. He'd promised him that his descendants would be as many as the stars in the sky or the sand on the seashore. He promised that he would bless the nation richly. That is, God's people would be in God's place enjoying the riches of his rule. Abraham, the father of the nation, he never tasted it. Neither did Isaac, neither did Jacob, neither did the generations that followed them who ended up as slaves in Egypt, neither did the generations who came up out of Egypt and for 480 years from the time of Moses up until this time with Solomon, there had never been peace amongst God's people. Not only that, God hadn't kept all of his promises to Israel, but now he had. Remember what Jim showed us last week when he pointed us to chapter 4 and verse 20? He said, Judah and Israel were as many as the sand by the sea. A great nation that is now uncountable. They were blessed richly by God. They ate and drank and were happy. They had rest and peace under God's rule. But not only that, verse 21, Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines, to the border of Egypt. For the very first time in the whole of history, Israel had been given by God all the land that God had promised Abraham. For the first time in history, God had kept all of his promises to Abraham in full. God's people We're in God's place, enjoying God's rule, his abundant grace and generosity. Why build the temple now? Because this is the absolute high point in Israel's history. Not since Adam and Eve left the garden has it ever been better. God has never demonstrated his faithfulness to his promises more clearly and more completely than he had now. And so it's easy to imagine that the people of Solomon's day were thinking, this is it. It could not get any better. 
that's the why now. But what is it? What is the building that Solomon actually built? The Burj Khalifa is the tallest building in the world. The temple wasn't. In fact, the temple would basically have fitted into this room. Have a look at 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 2. The house that Solomon built for the Lord was 60 cubits long, 27 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. That's 27 metres by 9 metres by 13.5. Okay? I got the guys at the glory to send us the dimensions of this room during the week. This room is 27.5 metres long. So you guys in the last row out there, you're out of the temple. Everybody else is in. (laughs) Bad luck. Uh, And it's half the width of this room. So the front five or six rows, you're out, everybody else is in. And it's twice as high as the ceiling. It wasn't very big. If you have a look on the screen, you can see the footprint of the temple. Right? This 27 by 9 by 13.5, that's the, the box in the middle and there are some outbuildings and some other stuff around the edges. The heart of the temple is here inside the red circle. The red circle, there we go. 27 by 9 by 13.6. Around the outside, you can see again there were some red three stories high. There are a series of outer rooms or chambers. If we look at a schematic diagram of what the temple might have looked like as it's described in chapter 6 and 7 of Kings, we see that in front of the temple was a thumping great big altar where the animals were to be sacrificed. And outside the temple in the complex that surrounded it, we see bronze structures, massive bronze structures. We see a thing called the sea. There's a picture of it coming up. It's just a thumping great big bowl made of bronze. It holds 44,000 litres of water. That's 44 tonnes of water. It's held up by a whole stack of animals. But not only that, there were 10 bronze carts holding 10 bowls that each held 880 litres of water. Outside the front of the temple, there are two massive bronze pillars. The best craftsmen in the world had put all of this together. There were bronze utensils, spades, and all sorts of other things like that. When it came to the amount of bronze that were used, we read in chapter 747 that it was too much to count. Solomon left all the vessels unweighed because there were so many of them. The weight of bronze was not not ascertained. Didn't even bother to count it. There was so much. Couldn't keep track of how much there was. And then when we read in 1 Kings 6 and 7, and we look at the inside of the temple, what we see is just extraordinary. It's made of stone. The walls and the inside are lined with cedar. The cedar is then incredibly ornately carved with fruit and animals and all sorts of things. And then everything is covered with gold. And everything inside it is just gold, gold, gold and gold. There was gold bowls, lampstands, tables, flowers, tongs, cups, snuffers, dishes, fire pans and sockets. Everything is pure gold. In the Holy of Holies, the most holy place in the temple, there are two massive cherubim, angels, gold. Their wingspan is 10 metres. These are thumping great big statues that dominate the Holy of Holies. The Ark of the Covenant in there as well. There is gold everywhere. And if that wasn't enough, we look at chapter 7, verse 51. At the end, thus all the work of Solomon did on the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things that his father David had dedicated, the silver, the gold, the vessels, and stored them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. It may not have been big, but it was stuffed full of treasure. Beautifully made, stunning craftsmanship. 
The best of the best was everywhere. When I was reading these chapters preparing for this morning, one thing struck me. These chapters read much more like a copy of Home Beautiful than the Bible. Right? These chapters are all about decorations. Right? You read Home Beautiful and it's about throw rugs and occasional cushions and why do we have those? I don't get it. Don't tell me. I don't want to know afterwards. <laughs> These chapters are all about how glorious the temple was. Nothing to do with what it was used for. I wanted the author to tell me how the temple functioned. Like, I wanted to know what the sea was for. I, what do you do with 44,000 litres of water? I have no idea. I still have no idea. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell me what to do with 44,000 litres of water. It's not interesting. But it wants us to see how brilliant and stunning and magnificent it was. It, it could just be the biblical equivalent of a throw cushion. I don't know. I wanted to know how the sacrifices were made, what the various bits and pieces did. But all we get is glory, glory, and more glory. Glory from wealth, glory from beauty, but also glory from something else. Glory from kept promises. You see, if we remember when the temple was built, then we'll recognise that it was only possible to build it because God had kept his word to Abraham. God had blessed Israel. God had given her peace. God had given her the land. God had made her his very own people and blessed them like no others. I was looking for the details about how it worked. The writer of One Kings was more interested in something else. And it was only as I wrestled with the frustration of not being able to work out what it was about that I reread and understood that Solomon got what the temple was for. I was reminded that the temple was not a home for God. God didn't live there. God couldn't be contained by a few walls, a box this big. Come back with one, to 1 Kings chapter 5 and verse 5. Let's see what Solomon understood the temple was. He understood what he was building. Chapter 5, verse 5, he said, And so I intended to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord said to David my father, Your son, whom I shall set on your throne in your place, shall build the house not for me, but for my name. What's the temple? The temple is a statement. It's a statement by God. It's a statement by God about himself, about who he is, about what he's done and about his relationship with his people. If you want to know God, you've got to look at this building. That's what the temple is saying. It's a building that defines God's name. It tells us all about him. How many of you have been up the Burj Khalifa? Quick show of hands. Everybody put your hands up. Okay, your visas are safe. Good. Put your hands down. <laughs> when you went up the Burj Khalifa, when you, when you go along, how many of you looked at everything and read everything? Your visas are safe. <laughs> the others, I don't know. There is one plaque right at the beginning. Did you read it? It looks like this. And on this plaque, the makers of the Burj Khalifa spell out how we're to understand 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 5. If we zoom in, let me read the words for you. This is what the makers, the builders of the Burj Khalifa understand that it is. It says, I am the power that lifts the world's head proudly skyward, surpassing limits and expectations, rising gracefully from the desert and honouring the city with a new glow. I'm an extraordinary union of engineering and art with every detail carefully considered and beautifully crafted. I'm the life force of collective aspirations 
and the, and the aesthetic union of many cultures. I stimulate dreams, stir emotions, and awaken creativity. I'm the magnet that attracts the wide-eyed tourist, guilty as charged, eagerly catching their postcard moment, the centre of the world's finest shopping, dining and entertainment, and home for the world's elite. I am the heart of the city and its people, the marker that defines Imar's ambition and Dubai's shining dream. More than a moment in time, I define moments for future generations. I am Burj Khalifa. The Burj is so much more than a building. It's a symbol. It's a statement. It's a declaration to the world. It establishes the name of Dubai on the world stage. God said, and so I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord said to David my father, your son whom I will set on your throne in your place shall build the house for my name. Do you understand what the building's doing? Look at the birds and you get it. Look at that plaque and you understand it. When we look at the temple, we're not blown away by the complexity of the engineering. Rather, we are given a glimpse of the glory of God, the glory of his riches, the glory of his kept promises, the glory of all that he has done for Israel, the glory that's constantly on view in these chapters. Flick to chapter 6 and verse 1, and notice with me the way that the writer describes when the building began. He does it in an unusual way. He writes, In the 480th year after the people of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign in the month of Ziz, etc., 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 et the, 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 the writer could have begun leaving off that first phrase about the people of Israel coming out of Egypt 480 years earlier. He could have just said in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, but he's making a point, a point about God's glory, a point about what God has done over the last 480 years. And that point? Remember what the last 480 years have been like. For the writer of 1 Kings and 1 Samuel, it's one book. He's saying, remember the previous chapters. Remember Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, etc., Remember that over the last 480 years, God's people have constantly, continually rebelled against God. They've rejected him, sinned against him, turned their backs on him and worshipped other gods. And when they've occasionally come back to him in repentance, they've been forgiven richly. And now they've been blessed beyond measure. During that 480 years, plus the 400 years in Egypt... God is reminding his people that he is gracious and merciful and forgiving and faithful and generous and kind and patient with sinners like you and me. He blesses those who come to him no matter what they've done. And here in the building of this temple, established at the very heart of the nation of Israel, God is making a statement to the world about himself and about the nature of his relationship with his people. This building shows off his glory in every way. I don't know what you think God is like. I don't know if you've rejected a God and want to have nothing to do with him. I don't know whether you follow a God and passionately pour your life into him. But let me ask you this. What is your God like? What is your view of God like? If your view of God is that he's, he's an old bloke, you know, sitting up on the clouds, a little bit feeble, you can pull the wool over his eyes. All you got to do is pray every now and again, and like an ATM, out comes, it pops out. Right, look at the temple and think again. Look at the glory Look at the majesty and think again. 
The God behind that building is not some old geezer up in the clouds. If you think that God is powerful, but removed, distant and harsh, if your understanding of God, if, if, if you have lots of names for God, but one of those names is not love, let the temple ask you to think again. Yes, look at the riches. Yes, don't lose the majesty, but also look at the mercy. Look at who the temple was given to. Look at the people who it was built for. And remember the forgiveness that is intrinsic in the building, the grace and the steadfast love that stands behind it. Remember that that is who God is. Remember that he's placed his people in his place under the abundant generosity of his rule, a people that deserved nothing. If that's not your picture of God, you don't know God. If that's not your picture of God, ditch the picture of God that you have and come back to reality. God may have cast Adam and Eve out of the garden, but Jerusalem in the time of Solomon was as close as humanity ever got to being back in the garden. The temple is the testimony that God wants to be in relationship with his people and he's passionate about us. Stop with me for a moment and let it sink in. Think about the God that you serve. What is he like? If your God view of the God of the Bible doesn't bring all of this glory together, you're following a false God. You're following a God who is impotent in comparison to this one. And if you've rejected a God who isn't like this, great. Keep rejecting that false God and come to know this true God. Get to know the real one. If you want some help doing that, go and see Connection Central afterwards. We love to sit down and read Mark's gospel with you and help you to understand and discover the glory of God by helping you look at Jesus. That sense that we're now back in the Garden of Eden right, is where we ought to begin with our fourth point. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 11. Listen, listen to the words of promise that God gave to Solomon as the temple was being built. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon concerning this house that you were building. Think about this construction site that's going on. Consider this as an offer to you, my king. God says, Solomon, if you will walk in my statutes, not you as a nation, but you, Solomon, personally, if you, Solomon, will walk in my, if you will obey my rules, if you will keep my commandments, all of them, and walk in them, if you'll do that, Oh, and by the way, I've given you everything so that you can. You were the wisest man who has ever lived. I've given you more riches than any other human has ever known. I've given everything to you. If you'll do that, then look at what God promises to do. Then I will establish my word with you. That is the word which I spoke to David, your father. If you do that, I'll establish your throne forever. One of your sons will always sit on your throne forever and ever. Not only that, but the whole nation will benefit. For I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Solomon, if you personally are obedient, I will live with Israel like I did with Adam and Eve in the garden when Adam and Eve and I were together. If you as king will be obedient, all of the people will benefit. They will have a taste of the brilliance of my dwelling with them forever. They will enjoy a life of such rich blessing, of peace, of grace and of rest. It's one of those times in the Bible where what one person does affects everyone. Adam sinned, we all sinned. Hear the reverse as being offered to Solomon. Solomon, be obedient 
and your obedience will affect the whole nation. His obedience would see the nation blessed, and if God then keeps his promise to Abraham, the whole world would then be blessed through them. Solomon was given this promise while he was overseeing the construction of the clearest declaration by God ever of his name, his character, and his glory. He's offered something that everyone will benefit from. All he's got to do is be obedient. When you hear obedient, don't hear sinless. He's not saying never sin. I remember the temple, what's out the front? Thumping great big altar. What happens on the altar? Sacrifice for sin. Obedient men and women confess their sins and ask God for forgiveness, and he continues to forgive them. Solomon's not being commanded by God, okay, I'm going to give you this hurdle that is so high that you could never jump it. You've got to be perfect from this day on. No, no, he's just saying, be obedient. Keep the law, and when you fail, keep the law by asking for forgiveness and coming back to me in repentance and faith. God expected Solomon to sin. He expects Solomon to ask for forgiveness and to rest on God's character, his mercy and his grace. The building that he's building is a testimony to that. And what we're going to see in the coming weeks is that Solomon failed spectacularly. He simply couldn't do it. The wisest man who ever lived who had more going for him than you and I ever will. He couldn't do it. Which is humbling for us as well, because it means if he couldn't do it, there's no way any of us could. The man who had it all, the man who had humanity's great hope in his hands, simply couldn't do it. Even with the temple in front of him. And he took the whole nation with him. He failed to be obedient, and the nation lost everything, including the temple. In 586 BC, the Babylonians came and they raised the whole thing to the ground, completely obliterating God's statement of his name to the world. In 586, the temple was destroyed. It was rebuilt 80 plus years later by Ezra and Nehemiah. And when the people who rebuilt it, who had seen the original temple, saw what they'd rebuilt, they just wept. It was like a tin shed in comparison. It was destroyed in the time between the Old and the New Testaments. And Herod, well, he spent 46 years rebuilding it again. And Jesus had some very pointed words to say about the temple of his day, Herod's temple. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 2. We're going to think about the temple and me as we think about what Jesus teaches us about the temple and its impact in our lives. Jesus is at the temple and uh, he's just got a whip and he's driven the money changers out of the temple with a whip. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Reasonable question. We're the religious leaders. You're on our turf. You've just driven those blokes out. That's just not on. Jesus answered them, <clears throat> destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews' response is understandable. The Jews said to him, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. Solomon's took seven, but he had tens of thousands of men working day in and day out for seven years. This temple, 46 years, and you're going to rebuild it in three days? Notice the comment that comes next. But verse 21, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. Solomon's temple gives us a glimpse of the glory of God. If you want to see the real glory of God, don't look at a building, look at a man. For Jesus is the temple. He is the ultimate place where we see the name of God in all of its glory. It's where we see God's love and mercy and grace and power and holiness. 
If you chase the word glory through John's gospel when you get home, again and again and again, when it's talking about glory, it's just talking about Jesus' cross. For there we see the glory of God, not in a building, but in a death. The glory of the UAE is the Burj Khalifa. The glory of God in Solomon's day was, was a model of his glory. It was just the temple. But the glory of God in all of its fullness is two beams of wood with God the Son crucified on them. The disciples didn't get it at the time, but we read verse 22. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he'd said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Three years before his death, he knew what his death would achieve. Three years before his death, Jesus knew where and what the real temple was. He knew what the real glory of God was and where it was to be found. Not in Jerusalem. Not in something made of stone and wood and gold. Jesus knew that the real temple in Jerusalem, sorry, the real temple was actually in heaven and what was in Jerusalem was only ever a scale model. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9, the last passage we'll look up this morning. In Hebrews chapter 9, the writer is explaining to his readers that Jesus is the fulfillment, not just of the promises to Abraham, but to every promise. And if you want to see his glory, that's where you go. The writer wants the reader to understand that the temple fits with Jesus, not Jesus with the temple. Look at verse 24. We read, For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands. He didn't get crucified and go down to Herod's temple down the road and do stuff. When he died on the cross, he went not to that temple, but to that temple. He says, Verse 24, for Christ entered not into the holy places made with hands which are copies of the true thing. That temple that Solomon built, the temple that Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilt, the temple that Herod rebuilt, was only ever a scale model of heaven, of the dwelling place of God. Our temple on earth was glorious in every way, but it's only ever a copy of Jesus didn't go into that temple. He went into that temple to offer his life, into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Jesus, you see, is like Solomon again. Solomon was promised that his obedience would bring blessing. Jesus, through his obedience to death, once for all, brought forgiveness for all. Look at verse 25. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For he would have to have, have to had suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus offers one sacrifice in the heavenly temple once and sin is dealt with for the whole of mankind for the whole of time. Verse 27. And just as it's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, he's coming back. He'll return a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Friends, we started this morning thinking about a public building. That public building was God's statement about his glory, about his grace, his mercy, his love, his forgiveness, his power, his extraordinary nature. If you want to see that not as a model, but in full living colour, don't go to cathedrals. Don't look for a building. Look for two pieces of wood nailed together. Look for the Son of God crucified on them. Because in his death, 
we see the glory of God in all of its fullness. Are you looking for God? Do you want to know what he's really like? There is only one place to look, and that is to Jesus. That is to his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his rule, and his return. You want to know what God is like? That is what he's like. You want to serve him? His command is to repent and to trust him for everything, to serve him with everything. If you see his glory, that is the only thing that you can do. Being his followers is not something we do part-time. It's not something we do on a Friday morning when we can fit it in. If we've seen his glory, his glory utterly dominates everything that we have and are. If you haven't yet worked out what that looks like in your life, come and see me afterwards. Go and see the guys from Connection Central and say you want to talk with somebody. And we'll find somebody who'll sit down and read Mark's gospel with you and help you to come to terms with Jesus, help you to see him. We won't take you to a building. We'll take you to a person. We'll take you to God's glory in all of its brilliance. Let me pray. Our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for Jesus. We want to thank you for a building that points to him. We want to thank you for two pieces of wood that carried his body. We want to thank you that he presented his death before you so that we could be forgiven once for all time. Father, in your kindness and in your grace, open our eyes so that we can see that glory and understand what you've done for us in him. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.